Hi, let's talk about our next big group within the animals, the ectozoans. These are animals that shed their outer layer in order to grow. Um, and again, ectozoa is not a phylum. Instead, it's a larger category that contains several phyla. Uh, and two groups within the ectozoa are big nine phyla. So let's look at our um, groupings here again. So uh, the last video we talked about the Lophotrichozoa and Ectozoa is a sister group to that group. Um, this is one of the small phyla in here. Um, there's only 10 species known. These animals are extremely small and live buried in sediment at the bottom of bodies of water like ocean and freshwater lakes. Um, the Lorisifera and uh, Alorica is in Latin means corset. So that's what these animals are named for, the corset bearing animals. And that's because they have this layer of plates around their base. And they are, uh, they use their um, little cilia to feed. Uh, the Priapola are another small group. Only 16 species are known of these worm-like animals. These are much larger. These can be uh, half a meter long. Uh, they also burrow in the seafloor. Um, and eat decaying organic matter. They've been around since the Cambrian and have been identified by many fossils. They're named for the Greek god of fertility and perhaps you can guess why. This is an interesting group. This is one of the few phyla, uh, the Anikophora. The Anikophora no longer have any aquatic species. Uh, there are fossil Anikophora that are were living in marine environments where every animal phyla every animal phylum originated in a marine environment. This is one of the ones that has no remaining species in marine environments, at least that have been discovered. Um, all velvet worms currently live on land, and uh, there aren't very many species. They're a very interesting group, though. They tend, most of them are quite small, but some can be um, several inches long. And they live in very humid, wet environments, so mostly in tropical forests and rainforest type of environments. Tardigrades are very interesting. They're in their own phylum. There's about 800 species of tardigrades. They might be the hardiest animals in terms of surviving very harsh conditions. They're extremely small. Most of them are only about a half of a millimeter in length and smaller. Um, and they can survive being frozen solid for possibly decades or maybe hundreds of years. And they can survive being completely desiccated. So that means being completely dried out, which would kill any other kind of animal. If you completely dried them out, they would be dead, any other animal. But water bears, you can completely dry them out, um, and then when they become rehydrated with water, they can revive. So that's a pretty unusual quality, which caused people to speculate that perhaps tardigrades could survive outer space. <laughs> if they somehow got blasted into outer space, um, that perhaps they could still, they could survive because, you know, outer space is freezing and uh, completely desiccates living things. Um, there is no evidence, however, that any tardigrade has ever survived a trip into outer space. Nematodes, so here we are, another big nine. Uh, nematodes are the roundworms, are really important to human biology, because not because we eat them, because we don't eat them, at least not intentionally. 
Um, but they are, there are quite a few parasitic roundworms. There are roundworms that affect crops that are parasitic on plant roots that are our crop plants. So nematodes are important to people for that reason. There are 25,000 species. Nematodes live both in marine, freshwater, and even soil. Um, they do have a fairly simple biology, although they uh, have a salome. They have a one-way digestive tract with a mouth and an anus. Um, they do not have a circulatory system, however, so no heart, um, no gills. They're small enough that gas exchange can take place over their entire surface, uh, and that's fine for them. Um, uh, they have muscles, they have a nervous system. Uh, one of the parasites that you might have heard of would, have, would be the trichinella parasite, which is found in pork. Um, it's not a problem anymore in the United States, but it used to be a big concern more than 10 years ago and for you know 100 years before that, that if humans who ate undercooked pork could become infected with the trichinella parasite. And then that if you have it, it's called trichinosis. So you might have heard of that. Um, C. elegans uh, is a popular research animal. It's a small soil bacteria or small soil roundworm. It's very easy to grow in the lab, which is why it has become a model organism. You'll notice that I have mentioned as we've gone through a few other organisms, like for the plants, um, Arabidopsis is a popular model organism for plants. So to become a model organism, uh, something has to be small, have a short um, reproductive cycle, and be very easy to grow in the lab, and especially be really happy at normal room temperature. That Those things make things good as a model organism, and C. elegans is one of those. Um, it's used by people who study aging. It's used as a model organism for people who study early development. Um, they're completely transparent, even, even at from, from egg through their whole life cycle, they're completely transparent. Uh, and this is a C. elegans here, so you, that makes them very good as a model organism. This is a uh, video of early development and you'll be able to see why developmental biologists like this organism because they're like sea urchins their embryos are completely transparent and uh, but they're in a different phylum than sea urchins and they're easier to grow <laughs> in the lab than sea urchins for sure and this is of course sped up this whole video is about 12 hours compressed into a minute. And you can kind of see the nuclei in here, so nothing is stained. This is just using a high contrast light microscope. So the nuclei of the cells look like little smooth disks in this particular video. And we know exactly where every cell goes in a nematode embryo. They have 250 cells or so approximately, and we know how each cell gets to where it's going, the fate of every cell in a growing um, C. elegans embryo. And here's a little video of how they move. So they do have muscles, they do have a nerve net, um, they don't have a brain. But you can see how they kind of ooze along through the media that they live in. So here's another big nine phylum, the arthropods. The arthropods have the most species. This is the largest phylum in terms of number of species. There are around one million named species in the arthropods, and there's probably twice that number of unnamed arthropods. New arthropod species are discovered and reported every year, pretty much. Uh, if, so if you want to discover new species that are undiscovered, um, work with fungus or arthropods. <laughs> they probably have the most unnamed uh, species waiting to be discovered. Um, 
So, it, and arthropoda are found in pretty much every habitat on Earth. Uh, of course, like the other, all the other animal phyla, arthropo um, arthropods originated in a marine environment uh, during the Cambrian explosion, I think are the earliest definitively arthropod fossils are during the Cambrian. And um, uh, since then, they have moved to freshwater and onto the land. And it looks like there were several different episodes of arthropods adapting to the land since all the land arthropods are not each other's closest relatives. Um, so during the Cambrian explosion is when we find the first definitive arthropod uh, fossils. And this is probably one of the most famous, let me get my pointer back, arthropods known from the fossil record is trilobites. Trilobites were absolutely everywhere in the, in the marine environments during the age of the, of, or before the age of the dinosaurs. Um, the great Permian extinction that happened right at the beginning of the age of the dinosaurs, you remember the age of the dinosaurs is bookended by um, mass extinctions. The first mass extinction 250 million years ago, the Great Permian extinction, uh, sometimes called the Great Dying. Many uh, very abundant organisms went extinct, and that extinction event, including trilobites, went extinct 250 million years ago. But we can see the basic arthropod body plan here with segmentation and a hard outer exoskeleton that fossilizes extremely well. And that's probably one of the reasons why we have so many fossils of trilobites is because they were arthropods. The fossil record is biased towards things with a hard shell. Uh, general characteristics of arthropods are that they have a hard exoskeleton and jointed legs. So anything that fits in that category that you can think of, hard exoskeleton, jointed legs, is probably an arthropod. Um, so, and their appendages have been modified over the course of the evolution, uh, over the course of evolution for different functions. So the mouth parts, the specialized feeding structures that we associate with arthropods, like this spider, these specialized mouth parts are modified legs. So the ancestral arth arthropod had just a lot of legs and a soft mouth, and the legs in the front became modified by natural selection into pinchers um, and venomous fangs to help with eating. So I have a little video here of uh, a crab eating that you can see. Watch how the little crab mouth parts move and how much they look like legs because during the course of natural selection, they were legs and now they're mouth parts. And that's really been the story of um, arthropod evolution here is the modification of legs. So you can see the crab has its front legs have been modified into pincers for grabbing food, and the other legs closer to the mouth are modified for grabbing and pushing in the food. And to me, that uh, uh, when I see that video of the crab moving its mouth, to me, it reminds me of the movie Predator. Have you ever seen the movie Predator? The mouth of the Predator kind of looks like a crab to me. And that could very well be where they got the idea. You don't have to look far to find things that look like aliens to us vertebrates. Um, so arthropods are completely covered with this hard exoskeleton made of chitin. Remember, chitin is that polysaccharide that's glucose. It's glucose subunits linked together with some nitrogen added that makes it hard. Um, for an arthropod to grow, 
it has to shed that outer exoskeleton. So here's a little uh, cicada emerging from the larval exoskeleton. Um, and that's, that really helped arthropods adapt to land, to life on land. So this hard exoskeleton evolved in a marine environment, but when arthropods started to move on land, it really helped them because it prevented dehydration. And that's one of the big problems with any animal phyla uh, moving from a marine environment to a terrestrial environment is desiccation becomes a real problem. So arthropods already had this nice watertight shell that really helped them prevent drying out of their bodies. Uh, we divide arthropods into three big clades and uh, these, this is what DNA evidence shows we should have. The pan crustaceans is a new category that's based on the DNA evidence. Uh, chelicerates and myriapods were uh, clades before we had DNA evidence, but the pan crustaceans previously had been broken out into multiple groups um, because it was thought that all of the land arthropods would be each other's closest relatives. So it, and that and that turned out not to be the case. Once again, uh, DNA showed that in fact lobsters and insects are more closely related than insects to centipedes and millipedes, and that is not what scientists thought before we had DNA evidence. It was previously thought that all those land arthropods would be their each other's closest cousins. So what this tells us is that arthropods adapted to the land several times um, and that a crustacean adapted to the land and that evolved into insects and a centipede millipede ancestor adapted to the land and that was the ancestor of the centipedes and millipedes and an ancient chelicerate which there aren't very many marine chelicerates left they're mostly extinct a marine chelicerate adapted to the land and that became the land spiders and mites and ticks and scorpions that live on land. So at least three times there was a, a separate adaptation from a marine environment to a terrestrial environment. Um, the chelicerates are named because of their mouth parts and so all chelicerates have have similar mouth parts. Um, uh, these chelicerate that are near the near the mouth that help them feed. Um, the earliest chelicerates are mostly extinct, the Eurypterids, uh, that we have an extensive fossil record of them, of course, because we do for most arthropods, there's a pretty good fossil record because of their hard exoskeleton, they fossilize quite well. Uh, right now, the only Eurypterids that are still alive are water scorpions, and this is a water scorpion here. That's what they look like. They don't look much like a scorpion, do they? Um, and there are many, many extinct Eurypterids, so they're very ancient. Um, the, the marine chelicerates that are around today are also uh, mostly extinct. The, one of the notable ones that still survives today would be horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs have are one of those organisms that is virtually unchanged over hundreds of millions of years. We have fossils of horseshoe crabs from before the dinosaurs, from before the Permian extinction 250 million years ago. They pretty much look like a horseshoe crab today. Um, and they are not true crabs then. Um, crabs are crustaceans. They're actually more closely related to spiders than they are to the rest of the crabs. And this is the underside of a horseshoe crab, which we don't usually see. Usually we just see their shield uh, when we see a picture of a horseshoe crab, but you can see their legs under here uh, and those little feeding legs up here. But they've remained virtually unchanged for about 300 million years. They survived the Permian extinction, they survived the extinction that killed the dinosaurs, and they're still around and they're not endangered. They're very abundant um, despite being used for food. Fishermen catch them and use and chop them up and use them for bait uh, and they're still super abundant today.
Um, most chelicerates that are alive today are arachnids, which you'll recognize that root as meaning spider. So things that are very closely related to spiders would be scorpions, even dust mites, ticks are all um, in the arachnids. And if you're trying to identify an arachnid, arachnid, one of the main qualities to look for is that they have eight legs. So if you find something, uh, an, an, an arthropod, and you want to know, is it an insect or is it a spider, count the legs. And if it has eight legs, it's a spider. If it has uh, or a ch an arachnid. If it has six legs, then it's an insect. So, but you, you of course have to get close enough <laughs> to count the legs to determine whether it is a uh, arachnid or an insect. Myriapods, this is from the Greek root that means literally 10,000, but also it's used to mean lots and lots because they have lots and lots of legs. Pod is foot. So millipedes and centipedes are the main two groups. Millipedes have millipedes are herbivores and non-venomous, and they're completely harmless. In fact, uh, people have giant millipedes as pets. There are millipedes uh, here in the Midwest. They're pretty small ones, though. I have, I have seen them um, uh, in my own yard. They're a, a maybe an inch to two inches in length. Um, I've also seen centipedes. Centipedes are around as well. Centipedes are carnivorous and they are also venomous. So uh, they um, use poison claws on their foremost limbs to uh, paralyze their prey. And if they bite you, it's it feels uh, I've been bitten by a centipede exactly one time, and it was very memorable. They, it feels like a bee sting, and it, it behaves sort of like a bee sting. You're going to get a big swelling, and um, it's going to be very painful for very many days. So those are centipedes. Uh, centipedes are very common as well. And so if you have centipedes, think of centipedes as um, sort of like spiders. Because if you have one in your house, they're eating something. They're eating other arthropods. So if you get rid of the get rid of the centipede, whatever they were eating is now going to flourish. Pancrustaceans. So this is the new group that was created in arthropods based on DNA evidence. We used to have crustaceans and insects, and now it's been shown that they are actually closely related. So probably insects which are terrestrial arose at because their ancestor was a crustacean that readapted to life on land so insects and crustaceans together form the clade pancrustacea uh, so here we're back to our little phylogeny here so chelicerates are the most ancient branch away from the other the rest of the arthropods. So chelicerates are a sister clade to all the rest of the arthropods. Myriapods are another ancient branch and these branches, these branch points, took place in a marine environment. So the first land chelicerates and the first land myriapods and the first pan crustaceans all adapted separately from a marine environment. Um, this group here, the Remipedians, this is an odd little crustacean group whose, uh, they live mostly uh, in freshwater aquifers in dark, completely pitch black environments, and they're mostly completely blind. Um, they're a weird little group that is there. See the dotted line again? That means that this relationship here is unsure. They may be a a yet another ancient branch of the crustacean lineage, and they might represent a separate adaptation to uh, a terrestrial environment. We don't know yet. It's another uncertainty. So crustaceans, that uh, these are mostly marine. They're, these are crabs, lobster, shrimp, barnacles, um, and a few others. They live mostly in a marine environment, which means the ocean salty seas. 
but there's also some freshwater ones and a few very few terrestrial ones in the group Crustacea. Uh, there's a few land crabs, for example. Um, crustaceans, like other arthropods, have highly specialized appendages that have evolved for various purposes. Um, some crustaceans do not need gills, but the larger ones have gills that are kind of similar to the book lungs that we see in spiders. Uh, barnacles are a sessile crustacean, and again, they do have a motile larval stage that swims around like all animals that are sessile as adults. And you'll notice here they have a filter feeding apparatus that looks like lophophore. It has slightly different embryonic origins, so it's not technically a lophophore, but it sure looks like one, and it has the same function as one. It filter feeds like a lophophore, like the true lophophores do. Um, so you can see again, here's another example of a difficult to classify organism, but DNA puts barnacles right into the crustaceans. They are definitely crustaceans, even though they're sessile. Insects are also called the hexapoda because they have six legs. Hex is Greek for six. Uh, crabs are sometimes called decapoda because they have ten legs. So that's one of the ways that we decide what group something belongs to. So if somebody has an undersea arthropod, if it has ten legs, it might be a crab. Uh, if it's on land and it has six legs, uh, it's probably an insect. Insects are extremely abundant and one of the most successful animal groups in terms of total number of species, especially beetles. Uh, insects first diversified when they uh, moved on to land. So before the age of the dinosaurs, um, so that would be before the Permian extinction, which occurred about 250 million years ago, Insects first evolved flight, and insects were the first animals to evolve flight. And beetles, like the lady, uh, ladybird beetle, or um, we call them ladybugs, but they're actually beetles. And you can tell it's a beetle because beetles have four wings, but two of the wings, the top two wings, have been converted from an actual wing into a hard covering. And that's really been the secret to the beetle's success, has been this armor on top of their fragile wings protecting them. Um, many insects undergo metamorphosis, and we distinguish complete metamorphosis from partial metamorphosis. So an, or an insect that has complete Metamorphosis means that the larval stages don't look anything like the adult. They look completely different from the adult. And we often call these maggots, grubs, caterpillars. We have some name for this feeding stage. The larval stages don't have wings. They are not uh, sexually reproductive. Um, they are a feeding stage. They're a f the larval stage is a feeding and growing stage. And here we can see an example of that. This is a June bug, which is actually a beetle. And uh, they're a quite a large beetle, and they live for almost a year as a beetle grub in the soil. So if you're digging in the soil and you find something that looks like this, that is a beetle grub. And most of them are completely harmless to your lawn, to your plants, um, although they do eat plant material underground, um, they rarely cause significant damage or noticeable damage to the plants. Uh, this whole trend over the last 20 years to try to convince people to buy poison to spread on their yard to kill the grubs um, is kind of, it's kind of ridiculous. It's uh, very rarely are actual grubs the cause of brown spots in your lawn. Um, if your your lawn is a healthy ecosystem, 
you have no need for things like that. And grubs are a normal part of a healthy ecosystem. And generally, for insects, the larva and the, and the adult might have completely different food sources, completely different environments, like for dragonflies. The larva lives underwater and is carnivorous, and the dragonfly, once it emerges as an adult, as a flying adult, is they're still carnivorous, but they eat flying insects and insects that are on land, but while they're a larva, they actually eat small fish and tadpoles and worms and whatever they can catch under the water. They go the between the larval stage and the adult stage is a pupal stage. And if we're going to pronounce it like the Latin, so P-U-P-A, that spells, we pronounce it pupa. If we were going to pronounce it like we should, if it because it's Latin, it's Latin for doll. Uh, if we were going to pronounce it like the Latin, we should say pupa. <laughs> but uh, in English, to say pupa sounds weird, so we don't say that. Instead, we pronounce it pupa. Uh, which isn't completely correct with the Latin, but um, that's what we're going to do. So here we have uh, butterflies have complete metamorphosis. There's uh, three different stages of larva, which are called instars. They shed their skin and grow larger multiple times. And finally, they go into the pupil stage. And when they are in this stage, this outer layer of the pupa is an outer layer of skin, uh, which becomes hard, and then they hatch out of that again and shed that outer skin one more time to become the adult. Uh, moths, which are closely related to butterflies and look very much like butterflies, generally they produce silk and they weave a cocoon to protect themselves while they're in the pupil stage. So that's often how you can tell the difference if you find a pupil stage. If it's a moth, it's going to be covered in silk. If it's a butterfly, it's not. It will be um, a naked pupa like, like this one for the monarch butterfly. So here's a little video of butterfly emerging, and this is a time lapse. And you'll notice when the wings first appear, they're really small, uh, and they have to pump blood into the wings. Did that freeze? No, it's just a very short video. It doesn't show the wings expanding. They have to pump um, fluid into the wings to get their hemolymph into the wings to get them to expand. And if they don't have room to expand their wings, the wings will never form correctly. All right, so here is our insect phylogeny. So we do have insects without wings, uh, the bristle tails, and they're not that rare, but there's only 350 species of those. And you'll notice their name here. We have this root. Oh, where's my pointer here? Let me fix my pointer. Okay. You'll notice the root here, Archie. Remember, that means first. So Archie agnatha, uh, they're implying that this is a basal group, that it's the first insects. Um, Zygenotoma, the silverfish. Oh, how we love to see those, don't we? Uh, they're quite common. Although there's only 450 species, they're everywhere. The rest of the insects have wings at some stage in their life cycle. So even if the normal individuals that we see, like ants, don't have wings for most, most of the time, they do produce winged uh, animals, they do produce winged versions of ants at one time of the year for the purpose of mating. Um, the most successful insects you can see are the beetles, the coleoptera, 350,000 species of beetles. There was a biologist who um, was a contemporary of Darwin who, when he was asked by a reporter what he had learned about the mind of God by studying animals and the diversity of life on earth. He said, well, God has an inordinate fondness for beetles because he was 
feeding that there are just so many species of beetles. Uh, the diptera, and here we can see the Greek root for wing, P-T-E-R-A, that's wing, and die is two, so the diptera are two wings. And those are all of the flies. Hymenoptera includes the social insects, bees, wasps, ants, uh, are all closely related to each other. And many of them have, they have a very different uh, sex determination system. So for the hymenoptera, for most of them anyway, uh, diploid means female, haploid means male. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, thing that has occurred during natural selection. And that's why for bees uh, and wasps, any individual you see is most likely a female worker. Um, and they have a queen, you know, and then they, they only produce males generally once a year. The drones are produced once a year when new queens are produced, uh, and the males don't do any work in the hymenoptera. Um, Lepidoptera, these are the butterflies and the moths, 120,000 species. Many of these are pollinators of plants. Some are have an exclusive relationship with particular species of plants, such that if the butterfly or the moth goes extinct, the flower will go extinct as well, because it's so reliant on its particular uh, species of butterfly or moth for pollination. Um, moths are generally nocturnal, butterflies are diurnal, and they're active during the day. Uh, their major predator for both butterflies and moths are birds, and for moths it's also bats who are active at night. Uh, the hemiptera, these are, uh, see, hemi meaning half and wings, so these are the half wings. Uh, but they all have wings, and some of them are very familiar, like cicadas. And these are what's called the true bugs as well. Um, things like stink bugs are, are the stink bugs that keep coming in our houses at this time of year, looking for a place to hibernate for the winter. They're in this group um, in the hemiptera. Uh, orthoptera, these are the crickets grasshoppers, locusts, everything that has those kind of jumping legs. Uh, and we see the root here for straight. Ortho means straight or true or sometimes correct, but in this sense it means straight. So uh, orthoptera is the straight wings, um, and they do have uh, straight folded wings. So that's that group. Also, uh, quite a few species in that group. And you'll notice for all the insects, except for these few, these couple of basal groups here, the number of species is in the thousands, and new species are discovered every year in these groups. Um, in the next one, we'll talk about the, the um, uh, deuterostomes, the echinoderms, and introduce the chordates, uh, which we're going to talk about in the next chapter. But we have one more video for this chapter uh, with the echinoderms, the deuterostomes.